You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. <laughs> history podcast that's not your history class with me your host katie charlwood history harlot and reader of books my oh my how time does fly oh katie this episode's a couple days late yep yep there's there's a reason for that and it is all it's all my fault it is all my fault i have no one to blame but myself and my cousins so uh they're not going to listen to this because they don't care. And also because um, my cousin Kimberly, whose birthday it was, she um, doesn't like things that are real. She only follows me on TikTok to like boost me through the algorithm. Like she doesn't like real things. She doesn't like documentaries or reality stuff. She's okay when she knows the reality is absolutely fucking fake, but she's just not interested in it. She likes to watch things that are escapism and fantasy and and all that you know a heightened reality if you will but she doesn't like anything that's real so she will never listen to this and (laughs) she'll tell people she does and she'll tell it's great but it's uh she doesn't she doesn't she doesn't give a fuck so i mean she wants me to do well but she's not gonna listen to this so it was her um 40th birthday and her, her husband surprised her with a trip to Galway. So she flew from England to Galway. And, well, my cousins, they flew from Scotland. And then I travelled down on a five-hour bus journey there. And then a five-hour bus journey back again. I swear to God. It was, by the old gods and the new, it was so fucking long. And I was so tired. And then on the way back up... I was so hungover. <laughs> See, my cousins drink like Irish rugby players, and I cannot keep up with that. And we were playing um this drinking game called King's Cup, which, if you know it, yay. If you don't, Google it. Um, but there's this bit where if someone is holding a queen card and they ask you a question and you answer it, you have to drink. And... I am really bad because I have an auditory processing issue, um, which is part of the ADHD. So if I don't hear something or think I've misheard, I'll respond. And also, I forget things really quickly. (laughs) So needless to say, my cousin's husband became my nemesis uh, because he kept catching me out. And I was like, every opportunity I could to just fuck him over, I did. It was so much fun. And my cousins were so mean to each other. <laughs> it's great. It was a good time. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. But um, yeah. And and yes. Yeah, so I I came back on Monday. I travelled down on Saturday after work. I came back on Monday, and I I could not record. I couldn't find my previous recording. I have been on two separate computers. I can't find it. It's not in my emails or my, um, like, online storage, which I've forgotten the name of. There is a, there's a word for that. The cloud. It's not on my cloud. I can't find any. It's fine. I'll get over it, but it's annoying. 
and yeah oh so many beautiful beautiful cocktails and going as i'm saying delicious beautiful but my lover my poor sweet lover don't drink it's bad for you or you know drink if you want but drink responsibly i did not like uh, yeah i was just i was just fucked and hence why this is a late episode sorry i'm sorry i really am but i thought you know what i'll be honest with you i could have made up something but no i was i was hung over and then i had every intention of recording like this week but every night when i came in i was so exhausted and then we've had these really bad storms and like i couldn't like feasibly keep the electrics plugged in with these storms and which is convenient because again I was so fucking exhausted that I just wasn't really up for doing it anyway but yeah and here we are today uh doing this but I know what you're thinking you're thinking quit your jibber jabber and fact me and fact you I will but first we've got to get our source on our sources are the girl on the velvet swing Sex, Murder and Madness at the Dawn of the Twentieth Century by Simon Batts Front Page Girls Women Journalists in American Culture and Fiction 1880-1930 by Jean-Marie Lutz The Story of My Life by Evelyn Nesbitt Prodigal Days, The Untold Story of Evelyn Nesbitt. These are both by Evelyn Nesbitt. American Eve, Evelyn Nesbitt, Stanford White, The Birth of the It Girl and the Crime of the Century by Paula Uriburu, whose name I hope I have not fucking butchered. Okay. I was sitting comfortably. Good. Then let's begin. Actually, no, let's not begin because I have one more thing to say and complain about, actually. So, on one of my old videos on TikTok, somebody complained about my voice. <gasps> my voice. And they said it was annoying. First of all, how very dare they? I am a fucking delight. Second of all, this voice. I'm sorry. Like, you can say whatever you want, but this is a beautiful voice. Like, I know it is one of the few features I have <laughs> that I'm actually really proud of. Um, this and the tits, obviously. Like, good voice, great tits. What more do you need? Not a lot, clearly. Uh, <laughs> A great voice and a fulsome pair of fun bags. Nothing else in this world. I'll coast through now. But yeah, it was just such a strange thing because it has been requested many times, I might add, that I do ASMR and uh, audio porn. So, I mean, really, 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 I'm trying to denounce my voice. No. <laughs> fools but anyway we should actually get started we i should actually get started because i'm going to talk about evelyn nesbitt the et girl the gibson girl the first supermodel and she has some very normal basic beginnings and then things go south pretty fast and leads to the crime of the century. Bum bum bum! Dramatic, yeah. So, guess we start from the beginning. Florence Evelyn Nesbitt was born on Christmas Day, either 1884 or 1885 in Pennsylvania, in this like small town near Pittsburgh. So we don't actually know whether she was born in 84 or 85. I mean, we do have a one year like idea uh the only issue is 
all of her like documents were destroyed in a fire and because of child labour laws like her they fudge the numbers a wee bit so she's either a wee bit older or she's a wee bit younger because her mum would just add a couple years on to her age so she could get work but that's I'm getting ahead of myself getting ahead of myself Florence Evelyn Nesbitt was born on December 25th, Christmas Day, 1884-1885, hey, one of those, to Winfield Scott Nesbitt and his wife, Evelyn Florence. Now, I'm not saying it's the most um, unimaginative of names, but, I mean, I do appreciate that she didn't just call her Florence Evelyn, or she didn't call her Evelyn Florence See, I'm even confusing myself now because it's the same name, it's just fucking Uno reversed. What? Not that I can say much. Um, but yeah. So, her father, Winfield, he is an attorney. He's a lawyer, a solicitor. So he worked and his wife didn't. Well, she didn't have a job job. Official employment, no. Because she was a homemaker. Like, her whole point was to stay home and raise her children and do the house and all that kind of stuff because her man was out there supporting their family so Evelyn she has a younger brother Howard who I think is like he's a few years younger than her I'm not sure when he was born but he's a few years younger than her and throughout her childhood I mean she's such a daddy's girl She's such a daddy's girl. And her dad, he fucking dotes on her. He adores her. He encourages her. So he he gets her to read. You know, she's reading like fantasy and fairy tales and folklore and other things beginning with F. And, <laughs> and you know, stories that were more like geared towards boys, like the pluck and luck. Like, I'm plucky and lucky. I got gusto and I'm going to go out there and do cool things. Like, those stuff. And he builds her this, like, little library, you know, to keep encouraging her to learn. And when she's interested in, like, music and dancing, he sets her up to go for lessons. Like, he is very much, like, giving her everything. Unfortunately, this is a woman in history. This is a woman from the past that we know about. Now... If you've been listening to me for any amount of time and or you know anything about history, you would know that generally things don't go well for women and this is no exception. You see, when Evelyn is 10 or 11, maybe, her father dies unexpectedly. So... There's Mrs. Nesbitt, the two kids, no income, and their breadwinner is gone. The person who supports them is gone. Like the linchpin, gone. And, well, mm, things just get bad to worse. So, they, well, they fucking run out of money, don't they? They're broke as fuck. So, the family is, yeah, they're penniless. And they lose their home. And they have to, like, auction off all their possessions. Like a Dickensian fucking drama. You know, just so they they have to pay off all of their familial debts. And, you know, so they don't die. And they end up kind of, um, they go a bit nomadic. They go from place to place. Partially because, you know, they're relying on the kindness of strangers. And partially because they're like consistently outrunning debt. Because it is following them like a shadow. And the only skill that Mrs. Nesbitt has is dressmaking. She's a seamstress. And, you know, I mean, this was very much a good skill for her to have at that time. Because, you know, many women made their own clothes. It was a very you know, womanly feminine thing to do. It was expected. 
It's the fucking 1800s, of course. But she is struggling to get work. And they're basically having to stay all together in one bedroom in a boarding house. And even then, sometimes they couldn't afford that. So Howard, her younger brother, he would be sent away to live with relatives. And it got to the point that Mrs Nesbitt, the widow Nesbitt, if you will, she ended up somehow acquiring money, not sure where it came from, maybe friends, maybe relatives, whomever, to set her up with her own boarding house so that, you know, people could board with her and she could gain some sort of income from that. Unfortunately, Mrs Nesbitt was not very good at this. I mean, she was pretty shitty at running a boarding house. Like, she would actually send her, you know, young daughter, her teenage daughter. Was she even a teenager at this point? Or was she only 12? Like, she was young enough anyway. And she would send her around to, you know, collect the rent from the boarders. Yeah, she was about 12. And it was, it's like, why the fuck would you send your child? These people probably ain't going to pay her. And a lot of the times they didn't. Like, Mrs Nesbitt found it really fucking hard to ask for the rent. And then she just got fucked over. And in the end, that just fell through. Like, it just, it just didn't work. Like, she couldn't run it. And, you know, because she couldn't even ask for the money that was due. Which, you know, I'm not the most business-minded person. But that seems to me like a fatal flaw in any kind of plan. Anyway, things get so bad that Mrs. Nesbitt just gets the fuck out of Dodge and moves to Philadelphia in 1898. Yes, yes, 1898. I was right the first time. And then it's all good. You know, she moves there to try and get work, to try to get work as, you know, a seamstress. She had pals out there who were like, you know, this might be a good opportunity for you. So Evelyn and Howard, they get sent to an aunt and then they get sent to someone else. And then basically they get passed from pillar to post while Mrs Nesbitt is looking for work. She tries to get work as a seamstress and she ends up in this department store um, as a sales clerk. But like for fabric because she knows her shit, you know. And when she gets a job there, she gets both of her kids' jobs there. So you've got, what, a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old working, what, 12-hour days? Yay, child labour laws. And they're working long fucking hours and it's not easy and it's just enough to keep them above the breadline. It is there at this department store, I think it's Wanamaker's, that young Evelyn is discovered by this artist. He sees her and he's like, wow. Because she is beautiful to him. She very much looks like how you're supposed to look in that era. You know, she has this dark hair and beautiful eyes and she just, hmm. And... This artist wants to paint her. And her mum agrees after, you know, checking that this artist was a woman and not some creepy old dude trying to, you know, get her daughter in the nip. And Evelyn, she sits for this artist for like five hours and she earns one whole dollar, which I think is like... $30 $30 in today's money, which is probably, you know, I mean, it's good for her because now she's not starving or having to work for 12 hours. I mean, sitting for five hours does seem like less, you know, bad than having to work a stock room for 12. Just putting it out there. So through this woman, this female artist, she gets introduced to these other artists in Philadelphia. 
and I mean they're I mean these are the bigwigs they are well known they have some renowned and they're not creepy fucking bastards you know what I mean they're all pretty reputable people reputable people I can say words so she's hanging out in this circle and things are going well for her she is discovering that she can make far more money as this artist models than she could at working at the department store and then she fucking harasses her mother until she lets her quit and become a model full time anyway she's only what 14 15 at this point like she's young some point during this her mum leaves Evelyn and her brother Howard in the care of someone, friends, relatives, whom's to say. And she, again, gets the heck out of Dodge and she relocates to New York City. I like I, Her plan was either to be a seamstress or to be a clothing designer because at this point she's like, I could be a clothing designer. Maybe. Unfortunately... She does not do well either as a clothing designer or as a a seamstress. Like, things are just, things are just not going well. Eventually, she thinks, "Mm, I'm going to get my family here because maybe I can get Evelyn to get, bring some money in. So she sends for her family in 1900 and the two kids come to her and they share this tiny back room in a building on 22nd Street in Manhattan. So at least they're in Manhattan, so they're they're in the good area. Maybe not a good building, but in a good area. And when Evelyn finally makes it to New York, she has letters of recommendation, you know, from all these Philadelphia artists and she gets connected to what is it, the Art Students League and like John Jacob Astor, um, Frederick S. Church and just like all of these like proper legitimate artists, again, not creepy fucking bastards, salivating at her behind a curtain. Oh no. These are proper artists and her mum ends up having to like be her manager and again, does not have the business acumen for any of this shit. So she is not really good at taking care of her or, you know, parenting stuff or business stuff. Not really super great at either of those. Needs to take a wee course or something. Um, she even like says that that she made sure that her daughter's reputation was protected. You know, basically stating that she never like was in the nip in the nude you know and uh we know that is not correct because we have images of her with tits out just tits out like they're there it's happening i used to be an artist model actually at one point so there are pictures of me somewhere in the nip at at 18 years old i mean i'm i look very young it's actually kind of creepy i actually had artists who and photographers who refused to work with me even though I had like proof of ID because I looked too young and because I was like really skinny and practically flat chested at the time uh they just felt uncomfortable working with me because it felt a wee bit you know pedophilic and much respect to those dudes by the way you're cool but it was just kind of a funny th- anyway back to this tits out tits out Maybe one day I'll tell you about the time I was hanging upside down naked from a trapeze. Anywho, there she is, skimpily clad, scantily clad, a wee bit naked, a wee bit nippy, definitely tits out. And she is, well, doing this at what, 14, 15 years old? Like, she is very, very young. Like, maybe 16, but still very fucking young to be doing this. So, Evelyn becomes, like, the 
artist's model. She is the person they want. So photographers and artists, they want her. Like, if you look at a picture of Evelyn Nesbitt, you will go, I recognise her. Because she is very much the Gibson girl. She has her hair sort of half up and half down. It's long and dark. Like, it's... And the thing is as well, once a woman had reached a certain age during this time period, she was expected to wear her hair up. Wearing your hair down was what girls did. So by her having her hair down, like she's very much showing that she's not like an, an adult grown woman. But yeah, she is doing so fucking well. She is everywhere. She's in Vanity Fair. She's in Ladies Home Journal, Cosmopolitan, Harper's fucking Bazaar, people. She's everywhere. She is on, um, like, pocket mirrors and postcards and, like, little tobacco cards, which were, like, these little pictures you had inside, um, well, like, cigarette boxes or tobacco pouches or, you know, those stuff. She was um, in like, she'd be in like different like outfits and costumes and poses and these like postcards are, um, they're called mignon, which basically means sweet or nice or lovely, you know, that kind of way. So she would be like this sweet, like ingenue posing, which was very different to like the French postcards, which were just... um dirty <laughs> porn french postcards were porn like they were very much again tits out and very very sexy or very overtly sexy sexy got no sean connery there for you but although i think this is somebody's kink because she looks sweet and adorable and some people are really really into that like that is their like butter and jam you know and so yeah, it's it's she's not gratuitous. She's cute and adorable and that is very much somebody's thing. That still feels like a fetish thing to me, but that's my own personal opinion. So yeah, she is um in calendars for fucking Coca-Cola and Prudential Life. I mean she is God, she's a Gibson girl. She's the Gibson girl. Like it's she's in fashion photography. Um, she's, she gets so much work. Um, she liked being, you know, like a a live model. She liked being photographed because it's so much easier, like having your photo taken, like posing, than having to be an artist model where you're being painted and you got to hold your position. And she just can't be fucked with it. She doesn't want to do it. She's like, no, don't want to do that. She says, fuck this for a game of soldiers. I want to do this. And she makes so much more money because for like a half day shoot, she earns five bucks and a full day she earns 10, which is like over $300 per day now in like today's money. And the money she makes from modeling is more than the money that like her family had made as a collective, all together, when they worked at the department store, like, she was supporting her entire family. Unfortunately, they live in fucking Manhattan. They're in New York. It's expensive. Like, cost of living, mate. It's, it's not it's not easy. So, you know, it's it swings and roundabouts easy. She wants to make more money and also she's getting really bored of just standing there posing. And as you remember, she loves music, she loves singing, she loves dancing. So, because she was so famous for being like on these cards and postcards and being like in this artist circle, these, well, Kind of like, I want to say like like movie producers would at the time. They, like they'd come around and find you. But like theatre producers would like be looking to add her to their acts. Because she was a known face. She was a known entity. You know, 
it's kind of like stunt casting nowadays, you know. You'll see somebody and they'll pop them in a movie or pop them in a theatre. I keep saying movie when I keep meaning theatre. And they'll bring them in there to just kind of sell tickets. You know, regardless of skill. And Evelyn does what Evelyn does, which is badger her mother until she says yes. So she gets her to, like, allow her to leave, you know, modelling and move into the world of the theatre. So she gets an interview with the producer of the Florida Girls, which is like the super long-running, long-running play, which is very popular. It's on Broadway. It's, it's the shit, really. So her mum mm, is a wee bit apprehensive about this, but then she finds out that some of the girls in the show went on to marry millionaires. And she's like, that's the trick. That's the trick. So... 1901 July, Evelyn joins the chorus line as the Spanish Maiden. Um, I think she's actually billed as Florence Evelyn. And <laughs> and people don't like her. Um, they called her Flossie the Fuss. <laughs> well, they didn't dislike her. They just thought she was a bit fussy. <laughs> So she changed her name out of spite. I I can't I can't be mad at that. So she just changes her like theatrical name to her nom de plume, her artist's name, to Evelyn Nesbitt instead of Florence Evelyn. Because she's like, not gonna fucking call me Flossie anymore, you fuckers. And after her run in Floridora, she gets this part in The Wild Rose. Uh so George Lederer a cannot say his name right. My tongue is not working today. What is wrong with this? Anyway, so he sees her and he's like, wow, she's amazing. He feels like she's going to be the big thing. So he puts her in the wild rose and after having an interview with her, he decides that she isn't going to be a chorus girl. She's going to have a more prominent role. You know, she's going to be a featured player in this play so she plays the role of this uh god i don't want to say the word um uh let's just say romany girl called vashti i'm not saying the g word i'm not doing it and she is all over the papers she is in the theatrical reviews she is everywhere and she's constantly in this like wheel of promotion and the What's funny, this is going to shock you. You're going to be shocked. This is shocking news. They talk about how beautiful she are, how she has a winsome face, how she's stunning and beautiful and amazing and gorgeous. They rarely mention her acting skills or her performing skills, in fact. Just how hot she is, really. <laughs> oh, what a surprise. Talking about a woman's looks and not her talent. Shocking. No. When she's performing here, like she's known, like she's being set up to be like the star, the star of the day. And, you know, there's all these like articles about her and how she moved from being like the chorus girl to being the star and whatnot. And this may not all be organic because there's a possibility that some of this promotion was cough, cough, encouraged by a Mr. Stanford White. Who is Stanford White, you ask? I'm glad. I'm glad you asked because I'll tell you. So, he is introduced to Evelyn, or Evelyn's introduced to him, like, when she's doing Floridora. And he's known as Stanny by everyone because, mm, nicknames are cute. And he is 46 years old when he meets the 15 or 16 year old Evelyn. He's also married with a son uh but out with that he has what one might call an independent social life away from you know the duties of family and whatnot so he would actually use friends and other acquaintances to um like talk to evelyn so that she wouldn't be scared of him or threatened by him like he would use other people to begin with 
And when Evelyn meets him, she's like, he seems terribly old. Direct quote, terribly old. Now, I want you to imagine a 46-year-old person like 20 years ago, or in the 80s even. Have you seen a 46-year-old from the 80s? They look like the Crypt Keeper. Now imagine what they fucking looked like in 1901. That is not a good... That's not a good man. Like, have you seen a 46-year-old man today? Some of them are hot. Like, some of them are still hot. I'm just... They don't look that... I'm just saying. Anyway. So, uh, he gets invited, or she, she gets invited to, like, luncheons and whatnot with, you know, other people and chaperones and Stanny. He invites them to his like skyscrapers and multi-floor apartments on um, one of them's above the FAO Schwartz, the toy store. And inside it's just fucking lush. It's lavish. See, Stanford White, he's an architect. And so obviously, shit's nice. So it's very extravagant. You know, there's beautiful furnishings everything's expensive and after they have lunch um like they go upstairs up two flights of stairs into this room which is green it's a green room with this large red velvet swing and it's suspended from the ceiling yes it's a kink room are you surprised now, I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum, but this is a fucking girl. This is a child. And this is a grown-ass, creepy old man. Creepy fucking bastard. So, creepy old bastard. So, he gets her to sit on this red swing. And she pushes, you know, she's on the swing. And there would be this little, was it a tambourine or a drum? There was a, a thing they were supposed to kick when they were on the swing. Now, let's just remember what undergarments were like in the early 1900s. Like, the way the bloomers were, there were splits in the bloomers. So they could pee, you know? That's how they were designed. So if she was on it, kicking her legs, no matter what, you know, she would be flashing her vulva at this man. So this whole thing was designed... For him to upskirt young girls. Like, this is a fucking child. This is a uh, creepy old bastard. So, they're all playing games involving the swing. And again, one of them is this little, um, like, kicking thing. And it's supposed to seem harmless because she doesn't know. She's not aware of it. Not really. She doesn't get it. Um, Because she's not. Mm, she's not that. I don't want to say mature, because she is, she's mature enough, but she's very innocent at this point. In Stanford White, he comes across as witty and charming and non-threatening and a lovely companion. Well, or at the very least, an interesting companion, because he sets up, you know, the Nesbits. So Mrs. Nesbitt, Howard and Evelyn with, you know, he sponsors them to get you know, a better, like, living accommodation. So they have, uh, they're in a suite in the Wellington Hotel, which he furnishes. And he basically wins over her mum. You know, he pays for their apartment, he furnishes it, and he pays for Howard to attend the Chester Military Academy, which is near Philadelphia. And... Then, he suggests that Mummy Nesbitt there goes and visits some friends in Pittsburgh and that he will kindly look after Evelyn for her. Mm. So, I mean, oh, I did such a good thing for you. One, he took control over their lives. He controlled their living arrangements he controlled their education. He also provided divide and conquer. 
So he got rid of Howard, he got rid of the mum, and now he has Evelyn. So while Mrs Nesbitt is out of town, visiting relatives, Evelyn is spending time with Stanny. And he takes her to dinner. Well, he invites her to dinner in his apartment, the one with the swing. So they're there and they're drinking champagne and eating dinner. And they drink more champagne, which leads them to the green room, the room with the swing. And while they're there, they drink a little bit more champagne, after which Evelyn changes into this, I think, yellow satin or silk kimono. He asks her to change into a kimono, so out of her clothes and into a, well, a jacket, technically, because a kimono is technically a jacket. Is it a dress? Well, it's like a robe. One way or the other, it's not exactly a complicated outfit to for her to get in and out of. And she's in this outfit. And that is the last thing she remembers. So, was she drunk, just drunk, from all the champagne? Or was she given something else? I mean, you got to remember, this is the time period where, like, people were just giving you drugs. Drugs. Just giving drugs. They were everywhere, you know? Like, oh, I've got a toothache. Here, have some cocaine. Oh, I can't sleep. Here, have more cocaine. That's not helping. Some morphine then. That'll do. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else. Like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes, even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery+. Plus. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can. In the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. The Art of Crime is a brand new history podcast about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. Season 1 is titled The Unusual Suspects, Artists Accused of Being Jack the Ripper. It profiles six renowned artists who have fallen under suspicion as the Whitechapel murderer. Lewis Carroll, yes, the guy who wrote Alice in Wonderland, is the one best known to us today. Joining him, among others, are the master wig maker and costume designer said to have supplied Scotland Yard with disguises while it was hunting the Ripper. The actor who originated the dual role of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and was playing it in London at the time of the killing spree. And the Victorian pop star whose brother, It So Happens, has also been accused of committing the crimes. As you meet each artist, you'll find out who they were, what it was like to work in their trades in the Victorian period, and why they've been nominated as Ripper candidates. You'll also explore this larger question. Why have artists, especially great artists, proven so attractive as suspects? Subscribe today wherever you get your podcasts and make sure to visit www.artofcrimepodcast.com. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. Or perhaps some opium. Why not? Fuck it. Live your best life. Content warning. Uh, We're going to talk about assault for a minute. So we're going to need you to skip forward about two and a half to three minutes just to be safe. Okay. Okay. So Evelyn, last thing she remembers, she's in the yellow satin kimono. 
Next thing she knows, she's lying in a bed and she's completely naked. And beside her is a naked Stanford White. And not only that, but the sheets are stained with her blood. She's lost her virginity. Well, I say lost. It was taken from her. This man assaulted her. He raped her. But again, this is the 1900s. And after this moment, Evelyn becomes... Well... It's always really phrased really funny in everything I've read. It's always phrased along the lines of she became his lover and his companion for some time. Um, but, like, this is coercion. This is abuse. This is her being forced into the situation because this is a young girl whose reputation relies on her purity. You know, she cannot be sullied. Like, that's the fucking point because misogyny and other fucking patriarchal bullshit which ruined these women's lives. Anyway. This is the man who is financially supporting her family. This is the man who could ruin her reputation because he was the one who assaulted her. Um, and while they're together, you know, it's more like she just agreed to it. Like, what other option does she have? You know? And she discovers over a period of time that he had been having, like, these, oh God, I'm not going to say, mm, situations with other young women and girls. And he kept an actual little black book. He recorded the names of every girl, every woman he did this with. Mm. So while this relationship is fading, she meets a young John Barrymore. Yes, Drew Barrymore's grandfather. Yes, yeah, so um, before we called them Nepo babies, we called them acting dynasties. <laughs> Unless you're Jane Fonda, who's just like, my dad was Henry Fonda. That's how I got a job. So, John Barrymore, he goes to a performance of The Wild Rose, sees Evelyn, and he's like, fucking yes, she's amazing. He goes to see the show 12 times. 12 times. Like, I don't even know if I've seen a movie in the theatre 12 times. I don't even know if I've seen anything 12 times. That's a lie. I've seen Grease t- two more times than I can count. And it's a dumpster fire and I fucking love it. So, I've actually probably watched... I've probably watched the uh, Peter Ustinov Death on the Nile like 50 or 60 times. I love Agatha Christie. Anyway, not the point. So... During this party that Stanford White is hosting, John Barrymore is invited. Because Stanford is friends with um, Ethel Barrymore. Because, of course he is. It's Ethel Barrymore. She's friends with everybody. Who is a very big actress at the time. So, John Barrymore and Evelyn, they have this relationship. He's 21 at this point and she's, again... 16 which still not great but definitely better than 46 so he's fun and charming and witty and and wait no I don't think he's the grandfather I think he's the uncle grand uncle yeah because Ethel was the actress he was a cartoonist I think anyway they are, um, they start seeing each other and Stanford White and Mrs. Nesbitt don't think they're a suitable match, even though they're like, they like each other and everything. 
John Barrymore isn't great with the family money. He squanders it and he's trying to, you know, he's fun loving and not great with that kind of stuff. So he's seen as irresponsible. And they would, you know, spend the night in each other's apartments. And this was not seen as a good thing. So in order to, like, separate them, um, Evelyn gets sent to a boarding school in New Jersey um, run by the mother of director Cecil B. DeMille. (laughs) And in order to stop her being sent away to this boarding school, John Barrymore, in front of Stanford and Mrs. Nesbitt, asks Evelyn to marry him. Um, but she turns him down in front of everybody. And while she's seeing Barrymore, but also still involved with Stanford, she starts receiving these anonymous gifts. You know, and they're from, well, they're from an eccentric fellow um, by the name of Harry Kendall Thaw. He was one of the many gentlemen vying for her attention. So there was a bunch of people kind of looking for her. There was um, like the magazine publisher, Robert J. Collier, the polo player, James Montgomery Waterbury. There was, um, yeah, and Harry Kendall Thaw. So these are just kind of men who are interested in her. The thing is about Thaw though is he's he's a little bit eccentric is probably the best way to describe it. I mean, yeah. I believe the general term is unhinged. So, yes. And basically, and then he's at this party with her and he informs her that he is the one who's been sending her all these lavish gifts. And he attempts to court her and this basically sets off this like conflict between Stanford White and Kendall Thaw and he kind of stops getting invited to stuff and he's not doing well in these circles and he is convinced it's because of Stanford White but yes circle back she gets sent to boarding school where she is then rushed to hospital with a case of appendicitis. Or at least that's the official story. However, the rumour mill did suggest that she was not in fact there for an acute appendicitis attack, but was actually having an abortion because she was pregnant by John Barrymore. It's after this that Thaw starts visiting her and providing her with more gifts and, you know... He gets more interested in her and Stanny gets less interested in her. Like, so Harry Kendall Thaw, he kind of has this obsession with chastity because, yeah, men in the past, even modern men, still weirdly, weirdly obsessed with this. And he also hated predators like white. So... He was very, um, he fucking hates him. He hates him with a passion. And because, like, social circles, he'd been blocked and banned out of stuff. And also, he was very vocal about the fact that he thought White was a predator. So, I mean, I'm not completely on Thaw's side. I'm just saying, I kind of get it. Like, I mean, right idea, wrong reasons. You know? Yeah. So, like, don't want people to be predators. But don't be obsessed with the concept of chastity and virginity like it's a fucking prize. Anyway, so he is, you know, paying for her, like, health care and her hospital care and all of her medical shit. And so um, he wants to take her to Europe. He's like, this will make you feel better. Europe. Because that's what they did. The European trip. So... In order for her to go, her mother had to go too because, obviously, it would be unseemly for her to travel alone with a man. So, they go and it Thaw has this awful, 
like I don't want like he has a schedule which I don't think Speedy Gonzalez could actually use. It is really um busy and it's very he's the rate of travel is really fast. And I don't know if it's because he's, you know, a few pickles short of a sandwich or whether it's because he deliberately wanted to make it awkward for Mrs. Nesbitt so that she'd want to leave. But uh they get like things don't go well because Mrs. Nesbitt and Evelyn they just start like fighting. And this leads to Mrs. Nesbitt wanting to go back to the States. But Evelyn doesn't want to go back to the States yet. So she stays with Thaw, who then travel on to Paris. And Mrs. Nesbitt, she ends up in London. So while in Paris, he is like suggesting, well, he's proposing. He wants her to marry him. And Evelyn is incredibly aware of his, you know, purity obsession. And she says that she can't marry him because she's not fucking pure. You know? Um, right. She doesn't tell him at first. She just says that she can't accept it. And he badgers her. He demands to know why. Why can't you marry me? What is this? Like, what are you hiding? Like, cause she's, you know. And he interrogates her. And she tells him what happened. She tells him that she was assaulted by Stanny. And Thaw, in a moment of pure clarity, proclaims that Mrs. Nesbitt was an unfit mother because this and that this should not have happened to her. So, yeah, no, baby, maybe don't leave your teenage daughter in the fucking arms of this old creepy bastard. Anyway, he decides that the next part of this European tour, the Grand Tour, as one might call it, was to these sites of virgin martyrdom. I shit you not. Like, they even go to, like, the birthplace of Joan of Arc. And he writes in the visitor's book that she would not have been a virgin if Stanford White had been around. So, he takes Evelyn to the Cats at Stein Castle, where he had, like, a couple of, like, servants there. And they stayed at one end of the building, and he had Evelyn, like, in isolated quarters at the opposite end. Now, this is where a switch gets flicked. He locks her up in her room and then beats her with a whip. He whips her, beats her, and assaults her for, like, a fortnight. And afterwards, he's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that to you. Yeah, sure. For a man obsessed with purity and chastity, he had no fucking issue assaulting her. Anywho. When they go back to New York, like, Evelyn, she's, like, sharing this information about what happened, and all of this starts coming out about him being, like, an absolutely unhinged, like, fiend. Uh, they also tell her about the fact that he takes morphine and that he's, you know, two screws short of an Ikea cabinet. Things are not, it's not great. But considering her situation, Yeah. So her mum had remarried, like, between leaving London and arriving in the States, when, by the time, you know, things move on, her mum's remarried, and they're cut off, they're done. And Evelyn, she decides to marry, finally, Thaw. So they get married on April 4th, 1905, in a small gathering of family only. And the reason that the marriage was actually agreed to by his mother was Evelyn had to, like, quit being a theatre girl and become, like, an actual wife. And here's the thing. Thaw chooses her wedding outfit. And it's not a dress. It's a suit. He puts her in a suit for their wedding. Romantic. He also promises her that he'll live the life of a Benedictine monk, you know, and he'll be good to her and whatnot. 
things are uh, not great for her after this. Because when she is living in the Thaw family home, she feels... Well, the gilded cage comes up a lot. The bird in a gilded cage. The Thaws were very strict Presbyterians and... Well, they were strict, they had no joy, and, um, you know, they were very restrictive. And she was really fucking isolated. And she thought, you know, when they got married, they would travel and do all the stuff that, you know, people with wealth did back in the day. But she discovered that her husband was very much a mummy's boy and um, was, quote unquote, a pious son. So he was a good Presbyterian boy who listened to what his mother told him. They didn't entertain guests. They didn't go places. She was just stuck. And while he was being a wee religious weirdo, he was also like starting this campaign to expose Stanford White, which, you know, would have ruined his wife's reputation at the time. Like the I'm just saying he didn't think this through. Like, he would have made her life even more difficult than it already was. He even got, like, really paranoid that he was being followed by gangs who had been hired by Stanford. But, uh, in reality, Stanford White thought he was of little consequence and didn't really give a shit about him. He didn't even think that much about Evelyn because this was something he did often. This was, like, a footnote in his life. But for uh, Thor, it was not. And he just fucking hated the man. And then, well, in a crazy random happenstance, they're supposed to go on this luxury, well, cruise liner. They were supposed to go for a European holiday. Honestly, Evelyn must have been like, fuck yes, finally, let's get out of here. They've been married for about a year. And they're heading to New York. And he gets tickets to Mamselle Champagne. Um, it's this rooftop theatre at Madison Square Garden. They go to Cafe Martin for dinner. Where they just so happen to see Stanford White. What a... Again, what a crazy random happenstance. And it is really fucking hot. And Thaw has this long black overcoat. And it's over his tuxedo and he is refusing to take it off. Like it is a really, it's June. It's June in New York on a rooftop theater. Like it is hot as fuck, man. You need to be taking that coat off. Like it's very suspicious. So around 11 o'clock night, you know, the show is just coming to an end. And Stanford White shows up and he takes this seat at this table which is generally reserved for him. And it is known to be reserved for him. And Harry Kendall Thaw, he gets up and he goes over and he comes back again. And he keeps going back and forth but not quite making it all the way there. Like he's almost at him, but not. And then during the finale song, I Could Love a Million Girls, Mr. Thaw pulls a pistol out from his fucking overcoat and from about an arm's length away from the man, fires three shots into the back of his head. Surprisingly, killing him instantly, he fired three warning shots into his head he had it coming so he gets shot he's dead stand for wait the predator has been shot dead oh dear and basically the things are going wild people are screaming they can't like it's just a lot going on and there's like different reports as to what he said but it's something along lines of um you ruined my wife uh you destroyed my wife, you took it from her, you took advantage of her, you abandoned her. Um, he had it coming to him. He'll never go out with another woman again. Um, he may have also said, you ruined my life, or 
you know, it it just kind of varies. Um, the, you know, well, here's the thing. At first, I mean, before the screaming, people thought it might have been a joke. And then it was very aware that this man's brains were all over his table. So, not, not quite great. Um, the law was basically taken into police custody and Evelyn just legs it. She, you know, she's smart enough to not go back to the hotel room because she doesn't want to have to deal with this chaos. And she ends up finding an old chorus girlfriend and staying with her. So the very next day, the newspapers are rife. There's just, just sensationalist media of the day. So, you know, there is, um, there's all this stuff coming out about Stanford Way and like all the horrible shit he did. And then it really paints Evelyn as this like innocent, um, an innocent victim who toddled into the arms of Satan. That was something somebody actually wrote in a newspaper. You're welcome. So it basically, you know, it basically tore Stanford Way apart, which is good. And it kind of promoted it as, you know, this man was standing up for his, you know, his wife's honour. But of course, there's always at least one male journalist going, Stanford just adored all beautiful things. Beautiful girls, beautiful buildings. No, he was a creepy bastard. Get over it. And then it comes to the trial. The trial which is known as, like, it's, known, it's known as the crime of the century. Granted, we're only six years into the century, but that's not the point. It was a big deal. And because of this, like, well, this is a rich family. This is generational wealth. And Thaw's mob is very aware that, you know, that mental illness runs in the family. And she tries to convince his defence team to work from a basis of temporary insanity as opposed to clinically insane because, you know, doesn't want her son locked up. And what happens is she has spent so long, like, hiding his eccentricities and, you know, mental well-being. And she works, you know, knowing that Everyone's going to get torn apart by public scrutiny. Everyone's going to be judging them and everything that goes with it. So she hires these doctors, costing her half a million dollars. Half a million dollars. Half a million dollars back then. Like, I, I don't even have the math for how much that is now. And so it's basically trying to work this as one, like, loan event spurred on you know by a crime of passion you know one person who's there but not there is mrs nesbitt she's working with the prosecution because they're kind of accusing her of selling evelyn to stanford white like prostituting her out like that is what they're worried about so she's kind of there but not there and evelyn has to you know go on the stand and she's gonna you know this is um, not great, there's nothing she really wants to do, but she's paid by the Thaw family an amount to do so. And, you know, if the verdict doesn't turn out the way they want it to, she gets a smaller amount. And if it turns out the way they do want it to, she gets a larger amount. Thaw was tried twice for killing Stanford White. The first time the jury's deadlocked because like seven are like saying he's guilty, five are saying he's not guilty. And Thaw goes absolutely batshit. He is well mad that, you know, they don't understand that he was he was he was being chivalrous, he was standing up for women's honour. And the second trial, well, yeah, um mm, and that but that happens in nineteen oh eight. And he again he pleads temporary insanity and he was found not guilty on the grounds of insanity. And he was sentenced to involuntary commitment for life in the Matawan State Hospital for the criminally insane. Luckily enough, he's rich as fuck, so he gets like really comfortable accommodation, he gets privileges, and you know, he gets he gets like a fucking legal team together and he's trying to get him de- declared not insane. 
um, it took seven years for that to happen. And <laughs> during this time, he escapes, flies to Canada, and then gets sent back to the US, and then gets released. <laughs> cool, dude. Cool. In 1910, Evelyn gives birth to a son, Russell William Thought, in Berlin, Germany. And she says it's, you know, it's Thaw's biological child. It was conceived during a conjugal visit. Um, Thaw is like, nope, that's not my boy. He denies it. He denies paternity. Um, he says, that's not it. Um, but she's like, no, it is. And uh, they can't prove it's not. So, well, at the time, they couldn't prove it's not. They could probably do it now. Some genealogy and shit. 23 in me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a year later, when her son is one, Evelyn reconciles with her mother. And her mother looks after her son. The woman who struggled to look after you, you're giving a baby to. That's it's not a good plan, Evelyn, but, you know, you do you. So she decides to go and, um, you know, try and get work. Because she's no longer being supported by the Thaw family. Like, during... During the trial, she was getting paid, like, a stipend, really. And <laughs> they give her money to go on the stand. And she, being the completely spiteful wench that she is, and I fucking love it, she donates the money to the anarchist Emma Goldman. Who, If you don't know Emma Goldman, um, she's actually who I talk about in my first episode of Gaslight Ghost and Groomed with BAFTA award winning comedian Louisa O'Malan where I am her resident historian. Da -da 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 -da. So yeah she she gets a bit of success um because she's like going to vaudeville and then she ends up in the moving pictures. She appears in um Threads of Destiny and in 1915 when Thaw is declared legally sane and gets released from prison, Evelyn divorces him, and pretty soon after, marries her dance partner, Jack Clifford. Their marriage does not go well. In 1921, she tries a change of career, and tries to open up a tea room. It does not go well. I mean, well, it's a tea room, but it was also probably a speakeasy, which is just good business sense. Let's just face it. But she, you know, she's struggling with money, she has an alcohol problem, and she's addicted to morphine. After this, you know, she tries to do, like, she joins these, like, wee cabarets and places. And she even tries a bit of burlesque. And this is going through the 20s and the 30s. And, yeah, things, things are not great. Uh... She gets really depressed and she tries to end her life by drinking disinfectant. However, the reason she survives is because her stomach was full of gin. Direct quote from the doctors. Like, yeah. So, things are kind of weird for her. She stays friendly with Thaw. And of course there's rumours flying around that they're going to rekindle their marriage. Like, especially when she shows up to like the opening of this um, Manhattan cafe he has called Shea Evelyn. Subtle, man. Subtle. But yeah, when he dies, he actually bequeaths, what, like $10,000 out of a $1 million estate to her, which we but like pocket change. I'm just saying. Like, hmm. But yeah, um, she kind of fades from the news, really. Until Albert Langford gets murdered, because her friend is Marion Langford. And she gets questioned about it, so she's in the news again. And yeah, it's an unsolved case. I might cover it sometime. But yeah, she kind of like fades into obscurity up until 1955, where she is. She is approached to be. At the technical advisor on a movie, The Girl in the Red Velvet Swing, starring Joan Crawford, where she earns 
seems to be her going rate. And it's supposed to be like based on a true story. Anything based on a true story, usually half of it's bullshit. And it's kind of like this imagined telling of her and Stanford White's like Stanny, their relationship, if you can call it that. Well, while she's working on this film, she fucking collapses from exhaustion. Like, mm. As she's in her later years, she decides she's going to leave New York because her son's living in California. She's going to go there too. So she moves there. She takes up sculpting. And then in 1956, she suffers a stroke, which she recovers from a bit. It's not the worst kind of stroke, but it's still not good. In 1966, she moves into a nursing home. And on January 17th, 1967, Florence Evelyn Nesbitt passes away at the age of 82. I mean, at least she got to pass away in a Santa Monica nursing home. I mean, it's not the worst way to go, I'm fairly certain. And yeah, that is the story of Evelyn Nesbitt, the original Gibson girl. If you liked my retelling of this story, please rate and review five stars. Say nice things. I feel like I was slower speaking this time. My, my head, I don't think, is fully back up to being normal. But that's okay. But yeah, rate and review five stars. Say nice things about me. Or say nothing at all. It's okay. My ego will be bruised, but it's fine. It's fine. Also, whoever sent me two books from Amazon, you didn't leave like a, a note. So I don't know who you are, so I can't thank you. And I would like to thank you because that's so lovely. I just, I like to be able to respond. You know? But yeah, uh, if you want to send me stuff, I've got a wish list on Amazon. Um, you can make fan mail. And there's a link in the bio or in the description down below. Not in the bio, but on the internet too long. But also, in addition, furthermore, uh, you can follow me on all the socials. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, I tend to respond more on Instagram because it's easier than anywhere else. I am on TikTok. I'm kind of jumping more Instagram and TikTok right now. So I am there. I will eventually get the YouTube sorted, but I just don't have time right now. And um, if you have any like requests of people and stuff or events you want me to cover, let me know so I can research it and fact check it and cry about all the research I have to do. It's fine. But yeah, um, if you liked this, please say hey, yay, and great, and share it with your friends because the more people who listen to it, you know, the better it works for me. It pushes me up the charts and it really helps me make this more of something but yes thank you so much thank you for listening i'm sorry for being hung over the other day i'm sorry that my lungs still haven't seemed to have caught up with the rest of me and you're awesome you're fantastic you deserve a hug unless you don't like being physically touched in which case you deserve a head nod i just nodded <laughs> so if you can see it but yeah uh recommendation time for listening i am gonna recommend wine and crime which i started to re-listen to lately because somebody was like i thought kenyan left and joined who did what now and i was like no i that's me and there and this like follower fan was like no no i love you both and you remind me of so and so and i was like oh cool i thought i'm sorry you're cool <laughs> sorry uh, yeah, God, I'm so tired. It's like the middle of the night. And for watching, watch the pro shoot of the Legally Blonde musical. Oh my God, you guys, it's just perfect. It's a perfect, it's just, they do it perfectly. It's amazing. And let me see anything else for reading. Uh, I am going to recommend the book Eight Detectives. If you like slithing, you'll like this. And with that, I will bid you all good night. Adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Uh, bye bye.